This is very personal work for me. Politics. Politics. I believe I was called to Sex. tell my story, use my voice, be a Game. voice for Game. the community, to speak Game. to Game. and for a community of people Game. that's Game. been ignored, denied, love, love, over relationships. relationships, religion. This is my life's work. Religion. religion. I want to use words to uplift, Every heal, single inspire, life. encourage. Do something different. Something different. Every Monday at ten. Good day, thinkers, thought leaders, progressives, and dreamers. I'm Craig the Writer Stewart, and this is so much to say. Today I have two very special guests. One uh, is going to remain anonymous, and the other is Dr. David Malbranch. We're going to talk about options in terms of dating someone HIV positive or not. As a person that is HIV negative, I've dated three people in my dating history that are HIV positive. And I have to say that it was not an easy decision in any of those cases. Um, in the first case, well, in each case, actually, each of them learned of their status well after we had already started dating. And because I had made the point to get tested, that was how they found out in most of those cases, in each of those cases. I wanted to have this conversation because I do believe that it is a difficult conversation. And I think that sometimes we often don't have the conversations that we should have simply because we're afraid of stepping on somebody's toes or being politically incorrect. That's whether you're talking about race relations. I think that's why sometimes white people don't ask black people the questions that they really want to know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's sometimes why we don't ask people with disabilities the things that we really want to know. Yeah. And the same is true with gay people. We sometimes don't ask trans people mm -hmm. or lesbians certain things because we just don't know or fear of being or sounding ignorant. But I think that the only way to really bridge the gap between communities is to have certain conversations. So this is something that's been really heavy on my mind because with the advent of PrEP, which I'll have you explain uh, what PrEP is, but just loosely, it's a it's an HIV drug, Truvada. Yes. And it is a pill that you're supposed to take. Is it daily? It's daily, yeah. Okay, and so you take the pill daily. But what I've been seeing in my experience, because I use Jacked, which is a social media app, mm -hmm. to promote my books. And so I have a lot of conversations with people on Jacked. And, what I'm, and even on their profile, sometimes I'll see uh, on prep and they're open or wanting to have raw sex. Right. And so it almost feels as if some gay men are using prep as if it's a license. Right to have unprotected sex. Well, it's, it's funny that you say that. I was just at a, uh, a community forum at Southside Medical Center, and we were giving some educational stuff, and they wanted to know a lot about PrEP, and this conversation comes up a lot. Um, I don't think and I don't believe people stopped using condoms a long time ago. So I think we can kind of do away with the conversation that people are just using Truvada as an excuse to not use condoms. I'm pretty clear that before Truvada came out five years ago, people weren't using condoms before then. It's now that Truvada is being used in part of the arsenal of preventing HIV infection that people feel more empowered to be honest about that. Um, there are several situations in which people don't use condoms. The first and foremost being is that it's not natural and people don't like it and sex isn't as good with condoms as it is without. And people don't want to admit that because We've been growing up in this culture. I'm 48 years old. I'm a Generation Xer. There hasn't been a time where I've been sexually active that HIV wasn't part of the landscape and part mm -hmm. of the consideration. And so I think when you think about those things, people got burned out on a lot of that. So people would start lying. And even though they wanted or they liked having sex without condoms, um, there was a lot of stigma that was going to be attached to that. Oh, you're a whore. Oh, you're this. Uh -huh. Oh, you're that and the other. And so what people do with Truvada now is they say, you know what? I'm taking this into my own hands. I don't prefer to use condoms or in case the condom breaks or in case my partner doesn't tell me. Like, I think you were blessed to have mm -hmm. people that, you know, you encouraged, like, we need to get tested if we're mm -hmm. going to continue going on. They did get tested and they found out. Some people don't want to find out. Some people won't do it. Some people will flat out lie. So what a lot of people consider PrEP as is kind of like a safety net. Mm -hmm. They'll still use condoms. I'm very clear that, tre that uh, PrEP is not kind of a catch-all. It doesn't prevent anything or it doesn't pre prevent everything. It just mm -hmm. prevents HIV. Mm -hmm. And it's about 90% effective if taken every day. Um, the best prevention, though, to be honest with you, if someone is HIV positive, like if you're in a situation, you're negative, the person you're dating is positive, 
The best way that person can prevent you from contracting HIV is by being undetectable and being on meds themselves. That's called treatment as prevention. And that by far and away is the best. There have been studies that have basically followed couples for years. Mm -hmm. One positive, one negative, mm -hmm. both straight and gay, serodiscordant, sero opposite. That's what they call them. And they followed them over years and with or without condoms, no, none of these people have contracted, none of the HIV partners in the, uh, in the relationships have contracted HIV. And so physicians and medical professionals and public health people are actually afraid to say it's 100% effective, but from the studies it pretty much is. And it's actually more effective than PrEP, more effective than condoms, but the, the message that we give a lot of people, especially in our community, we have a lot of black same gender loving men that may not know, may not, may get misinformation from Google or from social media. What you need to know is that these things are not mutually exclusive. You can combine things. Mm -hmm. So you can use condoms and you should use condoms and be and have PrEP. You can have your partner who's on treatment as prevention and undetectable, the viral load is undetectable, and you can be on PrEP and you can use condoms mm -hmm. and you can find other ways to have creative, positive, affirming, like good ass sex <laughs> without having this stigma and this kind of fear involved. But you can have those things at your disposal to protect you for that fear because it is a real concern. I think in the city of Atlanta, you look at DC, you look at New Orleans, uh -huh. you look at New York City, you look at all the Baltimore, you look at all these places, there's high numbers of HIV and it's always, when you look at the stats, it's always black, same gender loving men that they say are still the number. We're the ones that still are carrying this burden. And so the reality is, is that if you want to date somebody in Atlanta or, somebody, or somewhere else and you're on the market, it's more likely than not you're going to come across a brother who's HIV positive. Mm -hmm. And so you have to figure out what ways you can have good sex and have intimacy on top of that and whether that's a deal breaker or not. So it, it kind of brings up a lot of conversation, but there's a lot of misinformation out there about PrEP. There's a lot of misinformation about what's effective, what's not. And so... Like I come into the situation and one of the reasons why I came here today was because when you invited me, especially with this stuff, this is this is the shit I do every day. Right. So I'm happy to do and, this and every tell day. Us what, what's your title and what, what, what you know, exactly so that people listening will know? So uh, for the listeners, I'm currently, I'm, I'm a board certified internal medicine doc. So that's basically your general medicine doc for adults. I handle asthma, diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, heart attacks. Okay. I can do all that, but I have special training. I do, I've been doing HIV treatment and prevention for about 15. 16 years. I do sexually transmitted infections, screening and prevention and treatment. Um, I do a lot of LGBT health. I do a lot of men's health. I do a lot of research. My current title, I work with Morehouse School of Medicine. I'm okay. an associate professor of medicine over there. Um, so my, my daily job, I see patients for the most part. Uh, for most of my week, I work at the Fulton County Jail and at the Clayton County uh, Bar Board of Health, seeing patients living with HIV over there. But I also do a lot of community activism, uh, work with other kind of conferences and community-based organizations to try to get more education on sexual health, mm -hmm. which includes PrEP and a whole bunch of other shit. So. Well, well, here's the thing. Uh, for me, my concern with PrEP, and I didn't think I was going to start with this part of the conversation, but since we're here at the PrEP Bring it. end of it, <laughs> um, I'm still a little skeptical about PrEP. Okay. Um, for many reasons. One... For me, it feels very reminiscent of the Tuskegee experiment. Now we just learned of the Henrietta Lacks story that starred Oprah Winfrey, so it kind of feels a little bit like that. For me, I'm just kind of concerned because at what point in history have we seen white people so concerned about the health of black people, in, in particular black men? And so I know when PrEP first hit the market, I don't know if they still do, there were instances where they were paying like trials, like paying people, because I have I know some people mm -hmm. who were getting paid mm -hmm. to use PrEP. Mm -hmm. And to me, it kind of felt like they didn't know enough about it. And so it's like, OK, well, let's see what the side effects are, because they will bring these people in like every three months or every six months or whatever right. to test their liver or kidneys or something, their organs, basically right. to see how it was functioning in the body. Right. Again, I know that it's an HIV drug, right. but we also know that there are side effects attached to HIV drugs, especially Absolutely. over extended periods. Absolutely. So for me, the concern becomes, you now, I now see so many black gay men, and I know white men are using it and, 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 and Latino men are using it as well. Um, they're using it actually much more. They're using it much more than right. black gay and men. And a lot of it has to do with access, cost, insurance, to, and absolutely. these kind of things. Absolutely. So white people like far outweigh the number of black people that are using it, Correct. just so you know. Yeah. Correct. For me, it's just become a concern because I'm wondering, 
Am I going to read an article in five years in the Huffington Post that says right. rash of gay men now experience kidney failure? Right. So is it the exchange? Is that an exchange that perhaps, yeah, you're going to you're going to. Uh, prevent HIV, but then in five years you're going to be on dialysis. So there's a there's a lot of stuff. I wouldn't take it to that extreme. So uh, <laughs> what I'll say is what I'll say is this: Truvada has been on the market as an HIV treatment drug since 2004, okay. right? So I was I had already been practicing at the Grady IVP here in Midtown uh, since like 2001. So about three years when Truvada came on board. Truvada is a pill that has two medications in it. And the potential side effects, the two main potential side effects that we've seen over time has been irritation of the kidneys. It it damages some of the tubules in the kidneys. Mm -hmm. So the kidney doesn't uh, filter protein as much. It spills Mm -hmm. it out when you, when you go to the bathroom. Because you have similar kind of concerns like that with high blood pressure. Right. And high blood pressure medication, some other things can do that as well. Um, But the other thing is that it also can soften the bone or what's called osteoporosis over a long period of time. And the thing is that you have to realize when, when a, when a drug comes out, Uh before they even try it on humans, there's Uh probably about five to seven years that they've checked it with cellular modeling, phase one trials to make sure everything's going on, phase two Mm -hmm. to see like safety concerns, animal testing before they even bring it to humans. So by the time it's FDA approved, it's already been through like close to a decade, seven years to 10 years Uh of approval. So it's not so much of an experimentation. So I know it can seem like it sometimes Mm -hmm. when it comes out like that, like it's a new thing on the market. But Truvada, we were using for people with HIV for a long period of time. And I can tell you anecdotally from the hundreds of patients to probably thousands of patients that I've treated, um, I haven't seen a lot of like kidney failure where it goes to dialysis, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen some osteoporosis over a long period of time. The problem is, is that we haven't had the the long term studies correct with people who are HIV negative mm-hmm. and the, and so you can't really make a suitable comparison between and that's my concern and that's your concern because when you, that we, when you we see twenty three year olds jumping on prep right and just we, because they want to fuck raw and we don't know the thing is that let me let me say this uh-huh. to you as well um, they are doing studies with a safer version of Truvada right now okay. and also an injectable version that's every eight weeks. Safer in terms of? Safer in terms of the same pharmaceutical company, Gilead, that makes Truvada has another medication that is basically a pro-drug. It's like Truvada, but it doesn't get activated until it gets in your immune system cells. Once it gets in there, it gets activated. So 90% of it is actually activated once it gets once inside it's itself. In your cell, so right. as it, as opposed to the regular form of Truvada now, where it's more in the bloodstream correct. and it can get to the bones, get to the kidneys. Yeah. So what they find in their studies with that is that the bone problems aren't there, the kidney problems aren't there. But, but if ha- we went through all the FDA testing, then why why even put it out? Why not start with this version? Well, the, because they didn't realize with Truvada until they started following people along. The problem is, is that they don't know with people who are HIV negative, and then they have to do the That's studies separately with people who are HIV negative so they can approve it specifically. So this medication, it's called Descovi. It's mm-hmm. already approved for treatment. We're already usually using it for treatment for HIV positive people. But it hasn't been studied. The studies are not done yet to prove that it's effective as a prep tool for someone who is HIV negative. So that's where it's kind of like mm-hmm. still in the mix. So mm-hmm. what, I, what I suspect in the future is what's going to happen. There's going to be other options. And this is what I always tell people because I posted something. I was at a prep meeting yesterday in Dallas. And I posted something like, you know, talking with Gilead about prep and this is that and the other. And... Someone came on my Facebook page and was like, well, if people can just use condoms, if they just, you know, act right and use condoms, like, you know, why do they need a blue pill for? And what I was trying to tell him is that we have to take the the moral judgment out of it. And we have to take the, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. So this is what everyone else else should do. do. Right. Right. So the thing, the reality of it is this, we've been working on HIV prevention for what, 30 some odd years. Right. And we've been basically doing behavioral stuff, abstinence, which we know doesn't work mm-hmm. um which i mean we know it doesn't work because people lie about if they're absent uh, or correct or and then they have training. different definitions of what right, sex what that is means. they suck and date but that but, really exactly sucks. exactly okay. <laughs> behavioral study uh, behavioral interventions are hit or miss whether they work or not and so we really haven't had anything we don't have a vaccine we don't have mm-hmm. microbicides or gels that people can put in the vagina or the anus that'll help so when prep got approved in 2012 this is the first biomedical thing that actually scientifically was shown to reduce it reduce the risk of HIV transmission by 90%. Mm-hmm. That means your risk compared to someone who just does behavioral stuff 
is decreased by 90 percent. Explain what you mean when you say behavioral stuff. I yeah, know what you so mean, just but... behavioral is like using condoms, um, serial sorting. Like some people will say, well, I'll only date someone who's an HIV negative. Curbing your behavior. Right. So I'm just going to have oral sex. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to fuck because I, I know that fucking will be more likely to transmit HIV. Mm -hmm. So that's what people have done, just behavioral things to kind of get around and using condoms. And so this is the first time you've had like a pill. And what's interesting is that I, I don't know whether it's directly related or not, or just we've been ramping up our efforts on getting people who are living with HIV in clinics on medication undetectable. But for the first time in like years, the overall rates of HIV in 2015 went down by like 18%. It was plateaued at like 40,000 new in infections a year. Um, not, it's just overall. just overall. In the black community, right. the proportions are still different. Black women, actually, rates have been going down. Black MSM, men who have sex with men, have actually plateaued, plateaued a little bit. Latino MSM are coming up a little bit. White MSM are going down a little bit. But overall, it went down by 18% to like something like 37,000 new infections over the year. That may be a combination of both treatment as prevention, people who are positive getting undetectable so they don't transmit it as much, plus five years of prep being on board. Because there's about, I think they just told us yesterday, there's about 128,000 people that are on PrEP in the United States. Mm. So, I mean... It's but, interesting to me with PrEP, um, because you said that some of the side effects are similar to hypertension if you run those meds. But for hypertension, you would encourage behavior shifts so that Diet, you don't have to... Yeah. yeah, so that you're controlling your hypertension. Right. But when it comes to this one issue... We don't encourage that. It's just get on the pill. We do. We do. We do. People don't well, want to hear that, though. That's that's the difference is that you don't hear like, and I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether other doctors or other professionals, but I usually tell people like, it's not 100%. Like when I say there's a 90% mm -hmm. reduction, that's not 100%. And there are cases. Because I have read cases where people who, who have been on PrEP. I, and I know somebody personally who was on PrEP and got a very resistant strain of the virus. Yes. Um, and so that's part of the problem with it. But if you look at the whole thing, like I tried to say to this guy who was talking on Facebook the other day, well, it's not 100%. I was like, condoms aren't 100%. Right. Well, if you use them properly, they are. Well, they can break. Yes. There are some types of condoms like lambskin, lambskin condoms mm -hmm. where things can filter through. Yeah, and probably. so nothing is 100%. The flu vaccine doesn't prevent the flu 100%. Like, stop with the judgment thing. It's just, exactly. and, and just because, and I was trying to argue with this brother yesterday, I said, look, just because that doesn't work for you, mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say here is this. People attain their sexual health different ways. And if we have options, that's a wonderful thing. And that's the point that I want to make about PrEP because it is not 100%. Although it can be effective, right. it's not 100%. There are a lot of gay men that are using it as if it is a vaccine mm -hmm. and as if it is 100%. I just spoke to a guy just a couple of weeks ago who's in a relationship. He's negative, mm -hmm. but his partner is positive. Mm -hmm. So it's a zero discordant couple for those of you listening. And... The partner that's positive sometimes wants, he prefers to have unprotected sex. Right. And the one that's negative that I've had a conversation with has had sex with him unprotected simply because he's on prep. And I'm just like, listen, that's less than smart. I don't know if that really is a prudent decision. Well, I think the conversation that needs to be had, if someone is negative, I think they need, we all need to kind of get in the business of our sexual partners, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a partner who's positive, let me see some of the lab reports. What's your viral load? Mm -hmm. If your viral load is undetectable, then you're going to be less of a risk of transmission to me. So those conversations need to be had. Were you resistant when the doctors did the testing when you got HIV? Were you resistant to any medications? Because I need to know if you're resistant to the two medications in Truvada, because then my Truvada won't work as well, even if you're undetectable. So there's ways to open up this conversation, and that's what I think it's going to encourage people to do. The other point that you that you make with this is that it's not 100%. It's also not 100% with preventing other STIs, or sexually Correct. transmitted infections. So I have seen people come in. When I was practicing in Philly, I saw people that came in and were on PrEP. And even though I tell them, like, look, gonorrhea, chlamydia, herpes, syphilis, warts, mm -hmm. all those things are fair game. Mm -hmm. Even hepatitis B and C. Truvada only prevents... HIV mm -hmm. and it does a damn good job of that but it's not 100% of that and so you can still get these other things and even condoms when you look at condoms we were talking about this in the session I just came from if you think about condoms what are they good at preventing gonorrhea chlamydia and they're helpful for HIV and pregnancy mm -hmm. those are the things they really help out Syphilis is spread skin to skin. And warts. Herpes and warts are all skin to skin. So you could have and the condom. And even crabs. Yeah, and even crabs. You could have the condom on your penis. 
your scrotum absolutely is still available. Absolutely. Your anal area is yeah. still kind of available. So the thing is, is that nothing is a hundred percent. So what I told people today, and what I what I'd say to your listeners on your blog, is that we need to do a better job at educating ourselves what behaviors carry certain risks, what prevention strategies work against what diseases. And then you as an adult with this knowledge can figure out what level of risk you're comfortable with. Because Mm -hmm. some people are comfortable taking certain risks and Mm -hmm. others aren't. Like some people like, you could say, well, I'm not going to have sex with someone who's HIV positive, mm-hmm. but you may perform oral sex on someone that you don't know their status. Correct. And then you're like, and someone may look at you and be like, oh, Craig, like, <laughs> I wouldn't even do that. You all know where that dick's been. And well, you're like, right. um, yeah, but that's, you make a judgment based right. on your own self. And so everyone has to have an individual thing. So that's why I say prep included with condoms, abstinence, safer sex, finding other ways to be intimate. Mm-hmm. Like people don't talk about that. Like, what can you do? Like, I'm a big proponent of not screwing. <laughs> Really? We don't have to get the penetration. Like, why don't you just do foreplay? It seems like in the South... You mean you or you just Yeah, me personally, yeah. Really? I don't believe that it always has to get the penetration, but what I've noticed, and I'm from upstate New York. I've lived in the North for a lot of times. Well, I've noticed that the South... Y'all in the South... Y'all are talking about, oh yeah, we'll we'll, 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 we'll suck dick, we'll eat ass, we'll do all these other things, but once it comes down... To fucking, like, all these things are a prelude to fuck. Like, it has to get to fucking. And I'm like, why does it have to get to that point? Right. Because fucking is the but most risky. I will risky say when I lived in New York, I was in a six-year relationship. He was a doctor. I don't know if this is a doctor. <laughs> too, but we have, if we had penetrative sex four times in those six years. Really? Yeah, Were you satisfied or not? I was absolutely satisfied. See? Never straight. You can get a good nut without it, fucking. And you it can. Is. No, I believe you can. It is. It I just like the. I just like the. You know. Like, but I, I have like, seen I, this more yeah. in the south than. But then, I mean, well, when I lived in New York, he was the only person I had sexual right. experiences oh, right. with because we started seeing each other as soon as I moved there. Right, mm-hmm. right. But this has been a thing that I've seen in the south. Like nobody's open to non-penetrative sex. <laughs> right. Yeah. Someone's got, you got to be categorized. Are you top, are you bottom, are you verse? Like, what position you having for this? And I'm like, well, how about if I don't want to do any of that? And then it's like a weird kind of thing. Some people get it, some people don't. So, I mean, are you saying that this is the case all the time? Or are you just saying, so you're saying you could be in a long-term relationship without any penetrative Absolutely. sex? Absolutely. And especially if, really? if we're talking about, I, mean, I think it's an anomaly too, because yeah, yeah, well, for sure. if you say like, if I were to, if I were to say I was open to doing that, um, not having penetrative sex, people would look at me. <laughs> well, see, you would I, lose I, a lot of options. People would right. be like, oh, but, see, but see, I've had people say that to me before. <laughs> it's not that I would look at you like you're crazy. I would look at you like he oh. lying. He's yeah. going to probably eventually dip. I think people need to um, really? dis- decide like what sex means for them. Your listeners should see your face right now. For free. They really should see my face. Yeah. I think people desire intimacy. I, I d- absolutely crave way. intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. also... It's, and it that's also, a part of it. I mean, that's it's gratifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it also comes with like age and experience, like what you want. When you're younger, you do you both may... have a few years over me. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Don't start. Uh, but, I mean, it's one of those things where I think you learn that it doesn't have to always get to that. And you can yeah. you can do other things. So I think, again, I think where there's room as far as, like, sexual health and enjoying ourselves sexually, as well as kind of minimizing the risk for sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, mm-hmm. I'm just a big proponent of whatever works for you. It's the same like with religion. It's ex- it's the same with yeah. how you identify sexually um, or your gender identity, your sexual identity. Like what works for you? Like I can't dictate or monitor. Like I may call myself same gender loving. I know people and I use the phrase same gender like because I don't like the word gay. But people will look at me like just use gay. And it's they think that you have an issue. right? And, 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 and they think that I have to use gay. And they're yeah. so happy that they've come out and used the term gay. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? That term doesn't mean much to me. And it's actually more negative than anything. So I'm going to use same gender loving. They're like, well, you're crazy. And I was like, but why can't we just be respectful and say, yeah, that right. works for you. I'm glad you like the term gay. And I'm glad it affirms you. That just but, because we share the same community doesn't mean we share the same identity. And I use the same principle with this. Like this brother that was, you know, debating on Facebook. There was a lot of judgmental. Like yeah, people saw, would just stop. You saw the thread. I, I saw the one when you said somebody unfriended you or something. Is this the same person? No, it's not the same person, oh, okay. different one. So but, then you have a lot of Facebook uh, <laughs> views. Yeah, well, well, usually I say something and I'm opinionated, but people get very opinionated. And then I'm kind of like very clear, like I'm a physician. Mm-hmm. I'm a public health advocate. This I have is the my training. Space. This I've been is doing this area. shit for 15, yeah. 16 years. Like you, 
you read you did Doctor Google. Is that what you did? Right, okay. Right. You would would you go into a lawyer's office exactly. and say you Googled something about the legal profession and try to or argue you them take down what about he their says, profession? Yeah. The medical profession is one of those professions where people think because they do stuff on Google and they read that all of a sudden they're instant experts. Yeah. And that's not the case. So I had to kind of put my foot down on that, which I don't like doing, but I look at it and I was like, I've got a lot of experience about my back. This is my profession. Let me uh-huh. go ahead and do this. But I do think there just needs to be a lot more respect for what people do and not this kind of, well, I can never see myself doing that. Or, I don't need to take a blue pill. I was like, you're right. A lot of people, we've prevented HIV. People have remained negative for decades mm-hmm. without before Truvada came out in 2012. So yes, keep doing that. But there are a lot of people that may not be empowered to do that or may, like we talk about with intimacy, for a lot of people, not using a condom with a partner is a form of connectedness. And when you look at us at, as as black and same gender loving men, the trauma we go through every day from having to support our families, from having to be the strong one in relationships, to dealing with racism, to dealing with sexual prejudice for being same gender loving, we carry all these things with us. And sometimes I've noticed, even with Atlanta being a a largely populated black gay community, we are isolated on some several levels. And there are different segregations of populations and different cliques that exist. Mm -hmm. It can be very lonely. So when people want to connect, I'm a little bit more forgiving than most when I say, you know what, you made that choice. You wanted to connect. And I think one of the things that we don't consider is the mental health and the spiritual component of someone finding somebody that they connect with. And I'm not talking like a you go out to the no, to, to the den or to the you know to a book a bathhouse and then you just want to like have sex without condoms all night. But like if you have a partner that you're dating and the need to forego a condom, that's a level of boo. I trust you. And and I think it's a way of communicating. I see us on a different level, mm-hmm. or this is a way of communicating that I want you to trust me and and I'm trusting you. Right. And there are some people that. It doesn't hold that kind of weight to it, right. but we shouldn't necessarily always judge them. Just be concerned about their sexual health and if they're avoiding STIs or HIV or anything like that. But there's always this judgment um, that comes into play, and it's just it, it's with me. But I, I just I've always looked at myself like I'm I'm never I've never been in a position to judge because people could lift a rock under my life and mm-hmm. shit that I've done in the past and be like, mm, Doc. Like, right. but they think like, oh, he's well, a physician, well, so he's judgment, not ratchet, he's but, not this, but. I, so, I've done some messed up stuff in the past, so they were like, oh, okay. And I was like, I'm very clear to make sure yeah. that, you know, even when I worked in the jail, I realized the same thing. Like, there were people being judgmental of the inmates coming in. And I was like, do you understand that, like, if you go out to a bar and have a couple of drinks with a friend, you go, you drive home after that and you think you're fine, uh-huh. but you're over the legal limit. Yeah. You could, you're, you're one officer what? away yes. from being in that jail and you'll be judged and looked at with the same scorn right. that people are looking at these inmates. And I'm like, I'm very clear. It just takes one bad move. Yeah. One misstep, one human decision. And you in that boat that you judge and everybody else on. So I try not to do that with HIV, with STIs, with sexual behavior, with, Prison with anything like mm-hmm. that because it could flip on me in a heartbeat. But I, people judge all day. I mean, I know they do. People will judge you if you're spiritual, if you're right. religious, right. and people who are non-believers will right. judge you. Right. So the judgments just happen all day. Right. And this is no. But speaking of judgment, I think that those of us that are negative are sometimes judged when we make a decision to not date someone positive Mm -hmm. because the assumption is always, oh, you think you're better better. or, oh, it's stigma. Sometimes, somehow we always think that it's attached to stigma Mm -hmm. and it's not always about that. As I said at the beginning, I've dated three people that were positive and it was never an easy decision, but I think it was an easier decision for me because we learned of their status after we had already been dating. Of course, we had not had sex, right. but we had been dating for a period of time. Right. Right. And then we learned that they were positive. So it was in, it's easy to walk away because for me, I don't believe in cashing in your tri- chips right. when you realize that they're not perfect right. and then starting over. So right. I stayed because I was committed to them, but it is not an easy decision. If you had to do it over again, would you ask? Um, oh, I would always you, ask. Yeah. I would always ask. And in, in, in one case, the relationship that I was in, it was the last time that I dated someone um, that was positive. He actually blamed me because I had been so adamant about us getting tested. Right. We had already started begun having sex. We had only used condoms. I said, okay, we need to get tested though. We really need... Because to your point, I thought that we would probably get to that point that we right. weren't going to use condoms. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't want to... condoms get, break. Or condoms break. Yeah. 
But as you said to me one day in one of our conversations, I want the luxury of being able to have unprotected sex in a long-term monogamous relationship. And if, if you're with someone that's positive, that option goes out the door. Right. And so in this particular case, uh, we went and got tested. And he said to me one day in an argument, you know, if you hadn't forced me to go and get tested, I wouldn't even know this right now. And I'm just like, so where does that, where does that leave us? So like, mm-hmm. what are you saying? Like, are you right. serious? And then I also felt like in, in a lot of instances when we had arguments, somehow it always reverted back to his status because it became a conversation. Because it's always there. It's always there. Yeah. And because I mean, it never leaves. There's always a third person in the relationship right. with you, and that's that right. status. Yeah. That's and that's he, that's he, status. Yeah, and he said to me, um, I think you're just trying to find a reason to leave. And then, like, mm-hmm. then he would turn it and say, well... Um, don't leave me because you know I can't move on and I don't want to have to tell anybody else about my status. Like it just it became this thing where I felt like I was being guilted. Right. Even hearing everything that you've said right. and respecting the medical community, right. I still will not date someone who's HIV positive. Yeah, and there's and, that's that's, that's and, okay. Yeah. yeah. And um and people will hear that and judge it, but it's an evolution. You know, I didn't start off that way. Right. I married a man who was HIV positive, right. loved him, was right. willing to enter into that relationship right. with him. But when you get through the euphoria of a relationship and it ends, or you experience a condom break when someone is positive, you know, all of that stuff you have to take right. into consideration. You do. And I also, um, after that relationship ended, the marriage ended, um, I dated someone who had lied about his status. Mm. And so now I make it a point that we have to go get tested together. Right. I'm not going to just hop into sex with somebody, but we're going to go get tested together. Right. And when he, he told me the truth after we had had sex, and it wasn't um, penetrative sex, it mm-hmm. was oral mm-hmm. sex mm-hmm. unprotected, mm-hmm. but I tend to be extremely cautious mm-hmm. about this stuff. But I did what someone in the medical community would do if they accidentally got pricked with a needle or something. Right. I went on the... HIV meds for the post, post, the post Pat, exposure, right? post exposure profile. And those meds shit. are extremely hard. They can be, yeah. Yeah, and so people think, And you had oh, to do it for 30 days, right? Yeah. Oh, um, I'll just do prep, and, you know, and if I get positive, I'll just take them. These meds are really, really hard. Yeah. And they, that made me say, I mm-hmm. just never want to. Mm-hmm. Yep. I will fight to protect my HIV mm-hmm. status. But yep. before we, because I know you want to speak on that, but before we go to that, I, I just really want to stress that I think that sometimes those of us that are negative are sometimes guilted into feeling like we should be open to dating someone that's positive. Right. And again, as I said before, it's not always about um, stigma. Right. It, it really could be purely, I want to have the option of having unprotected sex in a long-term committed relationship. Right. It, 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 it has nothing to do with anything else yeah. because it really was a mental decision for me. Like I literally had to think about it. Um, it was really something that um, I thought about every single time we had contact. Mm-hmm. And here's the, the rebuttal that people from the HIV community often say. And I don't just mean people that are that are living with the virus. I also mean health professionals. But, often say... <laughs> people like me. Right. <laughs> often, uh, yeah, you guys always say, well, listen, because the numbers are so high in the black gay community or in the gay community, the chances are you're going to end up with somebody positive. Or they'll say, you should be safe with everyone anyway. Like, you should treat you should everyone as... That everyone is right. Positive. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't I've mean, heard, and it doesn't, right. and it doesn't right. mean that I don't. Right. But it just means that when you're in a relationship with someone that is HIV positive, that option or that possibility is always there. Because right. as we said, you know, sometimes condoms break, you know, and sometimes you just get caught in the heat of the moment. I mean, anything can happen. And again, I'm not trying to discourage anybody from dating what yes. dating someone that's positive. Yeah. What I am saying is you have to really do your homework. You have to really do your sure. research. And this is not just a drop in the bucket for you to just say, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to jump on prep mm-hmm. and be okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, some people do that. And I think that's where... You know, we all have to respect each other's opinions and approaches and experiences. Um, and I think I can guarantee you that for someone living with HIV, um, they infinitely go through more feelings of being guilted mm-hmm. than you could ever imagine. And I think that's why some people so, don't tell. They aren't so forthcoming. Yeah. And, you so, know? and so I think... W- being kind of like trying to be the PC kind of, uh-huh. let me step back and look at the whole thing. Let yeah, me step yeah. back from the elephant and look at the whole elephant. <laughs> um, you have to look at it as just put yourself in that person's shoes. Absolutely. And so your concerns over contracting HIV, while concerns and legitimate, living with it and having to deal Absolutely. with that shit every day is going to be 
much more challenging than your anxiety over it. Yeah. So if you start from that vantage point, but the problem is, is that I, th I think we probably don't listen to each other's experiences mm -hmm. as much. And so one of the things, um, one of the guys that I work with, I've done a couple of workshops with, his name is John Diggs. He does a, he's a licensed clinical social worker, does great psychotherapy. And he was talking today about, we were talking to providers about when someone comes in the room, like leaving your biases at the door, like mm -hmm. not being a biased medical provider. And he made a great point where he said, no, hold on to your bias, like, cause that's your experience. Your bias is based out of your experience. And so the experience you- Shaped. You sh yeah. yeah, the experience you describe right now, if someone were to look at you and hear you explain that and then be like, well, that's not valid. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a bunch of bullshit. Like, mm -hmm. I could listen to that and I was like, oh my God, I completely understand why mm -hmm. you feel the way you do right now. But I think we, we tend to kind of talk over each other because this is the right. culture mm -hmm. where, right. you know, CNN and ESPN and MSNBC and Fox, people just talk over each other and they don't listen. Mm -hmm. But we need to kind of hear what someone's trying to tell you. And I'm a big proponent that... Um, People have to be honest with themselves about what a deal breaker is. Absolutely. And if you say to yourself, you know what, I've had some experience, and even if you haven't had experience, but mm -hmm. you just say, you know what, that discordant status for HIV, that's a deal breaker for me. And I've met several positive guys that'll be like, and they're on the same side, they'll be like, they won't date people. They're that like, are they're like, fuck HIV, negative dude, it's too much drama. They yes. get all worried when something happens. Yes. If, right. if, if you cut yourself or if you use the utensil <laughs> they do, they all freaking out and I don't have time to deal with that. So I just want to deal with someone right. positive. Like if y'all got issues with that, go ahead. So there's that same kind of like, Absolutely. I can't deal with that. So I think just understanding both sides of the of the right. coin and respecting that and I think there's a lot of options yes. on both sides there absolutely are. absolutely, there absolutely. Are. You, know, you can as a positive person say I'm going to only date someone positive right 50% of gay men are but I think that what happens say, is when you're a person that's negative and you say I don't want to date somebody positive it carries more weight than a neck than a positive person saying oh i'm not dating somebody negative. you know what i mean <laughs> it does it's a little, it feels it's a little offensive different. when it's it comes from a person that's negative it's right? a little different you know? it's a little different but i think what's happening is because i want us to talk also about um <laughs> this uh you said that the numbers are, are we're plateauing for black gay men but they were on the rise for latino, uh, latino saying, right yeah. um part of that i i do believe is systemic you know some of it, it has to do with um, our religious beliefs, uh, you know, whether it's the black church, the black family, the black community. But also, I think, because I've thought about this so well, much. Make that connection for me. How does the black church and the well, black community I, cause these rates? Well, because I think what happens is, as far as the black church, I don't know about you guys, I've sat in plenty of churches where I've heard them say, in my lifetime, not today, right. but in my lifetime, I've sat in plenty of churches where I've heard the pastor say that HIV AIDS, or the, typically they'll say AIDS, is a gay disease and right. it's 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 god punishing this person you know this community and then you you often outliers though yeah. yeah and then you'll also hear um whether it's black families like you i've heard it in in different black families but how does that lead to HIV oh because i think i think that yeah. what happens is i think it affects uh how you see yourself okay and i think it in turn becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy i i know at one point there's a term called bug chasing. Mm -hmm. I remember at one point I was hearing, and bug chasing for those listening is people who actually go out and try to contract the virus. Mm -hmm. I've heard about people in the house community, right? Um, the gay house community right. for those that are listening. Um, and, and sometimes in groups or circles, if everyone in the group is positive because a person who may have come from a family that didn't accept them as, as a gay person, ousted them from the family and for them to feel connected to their group of friends or their gay family, mm -hmm. they in turn want to become positive as well. Mm -hmm. I've had uh, in my show, Jasmine Bonet, um, she said to me that she's even heard kids say that they were trying to get infected because at one time you could get a check for being HIV positive. Get housing, you would get that's housing, very, that's very, yeah, that's very housing insurance, insurance it's, it's and all of those well kinds of things. Right. But the piece that I wanted to, to kind of hone in on was I think that sometimes the numbers still rise with us, even though you said they're now, they're now plateauing, but for a long mm -hmm. time, they were rising. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is because the messaging has been mixed. Right. Because on one hand, you hear the CDC and health professionals all say, well, you know, you can live with HIV, you can right. thrive. And, right. and that is all true. There are, I know many people that have, that have been living with the virus, flourishing and, and been quite healthy. Right. But I think on the other hand of it, People are still dying. There are so many instances where I look on Facebook and I see a RIP gone too soon. Right. And and we know what happened. Right. But I think it confuses those 
coming in the generation behind us. Right. Those who think that it's not as deadly, those who are thinking, uh, well, you know, you can still look healthy because it doesn't have the same look. You know what I mean? HIV carries a different look. Like from back in the day where you could tell from the skin texture. and uh, Yes. But people look just like a person who doesn't have HIV. Right. So I think that the messaging is sometimes mixed. And so you have people who are cavalier and feel like, well, it doesn't really matter if I become HIV positive or not. But I would go back to your point. I just I think it's as simple as people don't want to wear condoms. I mean, you're saying that it's the messaging, the church saying that. Well, I'm saying I think it's a mixture of all of those. But things. I would say though that you have the um, the rate of children being born out of wedlock. That's sixty percent of all black kids are born out of wedlock. Mm-hmm. So heterosexuals, gay people aren't wearing condoms. It Nobody, yeah, it's everybody. So and right. I just think it people is. don't want to wear condoms. Well, I, and I it's think that simple. Yeah, and I think there's there's two points I would want to make with that. One is that condoms aren't natural. They're not. And then let's just be honest. It feels so much better without, without a condom. Yeah. So <laughs> let's let's be clear. And I remember when I was when I was working at um, Grady Hospital and I was on faculty with Emory and I was um, supervising residents when they would do stuff. And one of my residents was a white cis heterosexual male mm-hmm. um, going into GI <clears throat> mm-hmm. like gastroenterology is his, his specialty and he was like a second or third year resident he was a really good guy really funny we used to joke around while we were taking care of patients and stuff one day he said to me oh I heard you do a lot of research you know what's what's your research about and I was like well you know I, I do a lot of research around you know things that influence sexual health and condom use among black men of various sexualities mm-hmm. and he looked at me he was like he was like so you're you figure out why people don't use condoms? And I said, yeah. He was like, I think that's important. He goes, duh, it feels better. And I was like, (laughs) you know, I kind of laughed at him and I said, you're funny. I said, "Um, but you're right. Like Mm -hmm. he said it very cavalierly and it wasn't something where, you know, now I, you know, all the research on issues of masculinity and sexual identity and all that stuff I, I wouldn't do anymore. But there's that one component that people don't look at is that it's natural. Mm-hmm. It signifies or, intimacy and love and closeness and connectedness, and it just feels better without it. So mm-hmm. there's that point. The other narrative that I think we need to kind of get away from is 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 the focus on the individual level part of it. Let's be clear. Black same gender loving men are not getting HIV more than anyone our, our else. White, our, Absolutely our, our white or Latino counterparts. Correct. We are getting it more than the other folks, but it's not because we use condoms less. Correct. Because we're not having any more risky sex white, than they are. White gay men, white straight men, Latinos, Asians, everyone's not using condoms at like pretty comparable rates. Uh-huh. The one thing that I will say is that there's a lot of social and systemic stuff that we need to focus on. And one is that when people talk about black, same gender loving men, they tend to focus on the LGBT part of it. Mm-hmm. So they focus on the sexual orientation part of it. As if all black gay men live in gay what they call ghettos or gay um, communities, neighborhoods, and we don't. The difference between us and our white and other counterparts is that black gay men tend to stay in Only black communities. Only date and have sex with other well, black they, gay they, men. They do that, but we live in predominantly black communities. Uh-huh. We stay within black families. And so, so the pool is smaller? Is and so the pool is smaller, but when you look at that, when you look at issues of, particularly in Atlanta and certain zip codes, you look at issues of poverty, access to care, people not being uninsured, and track back to what we talked about earlier with treatment as prevention. If you're HIV positive, you don't have access to testing, you don't have access to this. If you do find out you're positive, you don't have money to get care, you don't know where to go. Mm-hmm. Your viral load is more likely to be high. With your viral load more likely to be high, you transmit, e- you transmit it easier. Yeah. Even if you're having, you're using condoms at the same rate that everyone else mm-hmm. does, it does. And then the other part of it is the sexual networks piece. Yes. And I'm I'm gonna flip that on its head because I do think it's a positive part that we need to look into. The, the The reality of it is is that in a lot of big cities, if you look at a pool of men, mm-hmm. um, in a black community, in a black gay or same gender loving community. If you have a higher prevalence of HIV just at the baseline, it's just more likely by sheer numbers that you're going to come across someone or date someone or have sex with someone who's HIV positive. Now, there's been a lot of research about this. And it's funny because the research comes from a lot of, most of it comes from a lot of white investigators Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) who don't understand quite everything. But they they look at that as almost like kind of a bad thing. And what they found out is that black men, we tend to, partner with each other 
as more, opposed to more so sex with, with other races or absolutely. other ethnicities. More so than like Asians with Asians, Latinos with Latinos, uh-huh. white with white, so on and so uh-huh. forth. And so there was we one, like what we like. <laughs> but also too, I think it's a positive thing because that's yeah, that's black men living black men. I think that's absolutely. an absolutely affirming thing. But they've twisted it around to this thing where it's like, well, don't date your own because you're more likely to get HIV right. positive. And there was one study back in 2009 that looked in San Francisco, and they found that uh, they interviewed a whole bunch of different gay men of different uh, different races and ethnicities, and they found, not surprisingly, in a predominantly white Latino and Asian crowd that black men were not really featured. And so black men were not considered as attractive or as desirable as these other ethnicities. And Mm. what what the researchers concluded was that, and I'm laughing because it's just so fucking funny that that this actually got published, is that they thought because of the racism, because whites and Latinos and Asians didn't want us, that because of the, the that oh, no, racism, they want us. no, well, there's that other part. We'll get to that. But because they didn't want us, we were left with each other as kind of the consolation prize. Really? Right. So we didn't have options. So because, that's why. Okay. Because whitey is the option. Uh-huh, Whitey's the uh-huh. main option. Because the the pinnacle of masculinity is a white, blonde haired, blue eyed guy. And since he doesn't want us, we're so traumatized. It's like. Oh, well, I guess I'm going to date you then. Right. Okay, I'm, I guess I'm going to date you because he don't like me. And da, 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 I guess you're just going to be my consolation prize. Instead of saying, no, actually, black men, are, we are choosing Absolutely. to love each other, which is a good thing. But you've contorted it mm-hmm. into this craziness uh-huh. right now. So I can't really get with that. But I think when you look at all the stuff, the insurance, the access to care, and combine that with the individual level behavior and that you combine it with a high prevalence now and how we network with each other more, you have a potent mix for an epidemic to Correct. keep propagating. So there's tons of ways you can intervene on all these levels. Um, one of them's an individual level, but we tend to focus solely on the individual level. Just wear condoms more, just use prep, just do this and do all this other stuff. And that's the hard part of it is that, you know, we can't just focus on the individual level. We have to work on these other kind of systemic access to care levels, networking levels, community levels as well, um, if we're going to kind of address and save ourselves, to be frank. One of the things that I've also noticed when I've asked people um, their status, oftentimes, like if I say, well, what's your status? You know, instead of them saying positive or negative, often I'm hearing people say, I'm undetectable. Like they won't choose <laughs> the positive or negative. They'll just go well, to it's like the undetectable. Like gender loving men as opposed to gay. <laughs> yeah, it's like a preference. Right. Yes. Yeah, no, a it's not the same. Stop, stop doing right. that. Stop doing that. It's not the same. That's it not is. a good analogy. Right. So it's not. From, it's not. From my perspective, I almost feel like try it. Like did that. he try it? Yeah, I know he did. <laughs> He's been trying See, I knew nothing to you. Here. You should be directing that shade toward him. <laughs> right. He's been trying it since he got here. Right. But but you know, so when a person says I'm undetectable it's almost like this, uh, like you were saying earlier about like there's this division in, in communities. It's almost like they're creating a hierarchy, almost as if it sounds better. It, it kind of is, but it's also, it's, I would also look at the positive aspects of that mm-hmm. because there are, um, I know Daniel Driven, who's a local community activist and uh, public health, great guy. He, he works and he has a... Um, he has a community-based organization called Thrive and also does mm-hmm. a Facebook page with what's called the Undetectables. And so what they do is kind of promote and kind of encourage each other, and it's kind of a safe space for a community, people who are living with HIV to kind of... I mean, for me, it means they're managing their... Right, and that's what yeah, it is. So it's on sure. a positive level, but yeah. it's become kind of integrated into the fabric because even on Jack and Grinder, you see some people will say... HIV negative on PrEP are positive, undetectable. And I've heard different anecdotal stories here and there that like some people will say they're on PrEP, but they're actually positive. Absolutely. And so they'll try to do that. But then also other people will just lie and other people will say they're undetectable, but they're really not. But they say they're undetectable, undetectable because they want to be able to have that access or not get the stigma. It all rolls around like people trying to deal with the trauma of stigma and manipulating Uh something to have a sexual life back to what it was before the HIV status and try to work that way. It doesn't make it right, but understanding, try to where somebody is coming from. But the problem is, is that hurt people, like it's a cliche, hurt people, people hurt hurt people. So So do you think in some instances, people who are undetectable 
I mean, who are not undetectable will say they're undetectable of just course. because people they lie. think people lie and say they're HIV negative when they're positive. People do that all the time. People people will do that. Like people will just. And I've met be people who say they're so, yeah. on prep, they're negative, yeah. but yeah. you look at them, you look, you're like, well, you look like you've been on HIV meds long term for a long time. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and, and, and like when people just started right. And I know somebody's probably thinking, what does it look like to be on HIV meds for a long yeah, you time? you want to describe that? But <laughs> <laughs> Skin texture, hair. Yeah. Right. Hair thin. Right. Yeah. And so, again. Some of, the older medic some of the older medication caused people to gain weight in certain areas of uh -huh. the body. Facial they used to call it a Crixivan belly because it was a, a yeah. drug called Crixivan. Yeah, and, and they get kinda... like this big buffalo hump on the back of their yeah. neck. Uh -huh. So some of the more toxic meds in the past used to do all that kind of stuff. The meds nowadays are not like that. They don't right. cause the side effects. So you can tell when someone's a long-term survivor. Mm -hmm. um, and so if that has happened, if they've lost some of the weight in their face or some of the fat in their face. Right, it's like the fat relocates the fat or something, redistributes yeah, in the body. Yeah, it's called... Um, lipodystrophy or yes. lipoatrophy is the yeah. term for it yeah. so you can kind of have these things so but i mean it's interesting but people will fool themselves if they're looking at someone trying to figure out if they're positive or not yeah like mm -hmm. and that's why i think and, although and, it's which a, goes I, back to what i was I'll, saying I'll, earlier like hiv has a healthy face now yeah it, although it it's a cliche like, like you else. said with the clinicians that say you should treat everybody like they're positive mm -hmm. there is some kind of truth to that because what's happening is that people who assume that someone is negative or or unknown, they just don't discuss it, are more likely to take risks than if someone actually says, hey, I'm positive up front. Then all of a sudden, it's out in the open, and people uh -huh. can say, well, okay, so what do I do now? Oh, but I, okay, this is what I'll do, this is what I won't do. And then you can negotiate it a little bit better, whereas if you don't know and you make assumptions, well, he's pretty masculine, oh, he's pretty cute, oh, his socks are clean. Well, he got a nice gym oh, body. Oh, he got a nice gym body, yeah. So I'm gonna do this and this, yeah, and this. That. yeah so I'll let this go. But to, that's what- To your point, that's why people. People people slip up because they make assumptions based on how well, people. Well, my look. thing is, I don't. I, I've always wondered, like, why don't we promote being negative? Because I mean, of course, you have the HIV ribbon, but there isn't really a ribbon for. I think there is. Is it a blue one? Is it a blue ribbon? Blue ribbon. Yeah, okay. The, the green one is STI awareness. Right. So it's like, why don't we really? Because I think that we really need to celebrate those of us that are negative. But I think again, it's just such a. Right. You know, you, you, it's such a touchy subject, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this conversation is right. to take right. some of the sting out out of it. Right. Because I recently recently was tested, and I posted my results. negative result right. on my social media, right. and I saw. <laughs> were there some negative comments yeah. about it? Right, <laughs> like what? You know, the kids or something else, but... like, they, like you were bragging or something. <laughs> yeah, and I put on there because what I put was, um, and I'm and I'm. I'm just kind of paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly what the what, what right. the post said. Right. But it said something to the effect of, it was like my birthday. It was like around my birthday. Right. And I said, um, another birthday gift for my mom. That's good. From me to my mom, right. Right? right? And so a couple of the kids got the comment down in my... <laughs> in my <laughs> I think I remember that. Post. You remember that? And so one of them said something like, well, I'm trying to figure out why this is a birthday gift as if being positive is a problem. I mean, they just went into this whole dialogue but I didn't even bother to. When they went low, I didn't even you went high. I, I, listen, <laughs> real Michelle Obama. I just left it, left it alone. But part of the reason why I said that in my my post was because when I first came out to my mom right. um, many years ago, uh, one of the concerns that she had in our conversation, and I talk about this in the first book, mm -hmm. she was saying um, one of my concerns is that you would become positive. My she said because e thing. your mom did mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. And she said because everybody that I know that's gay is positive. Is positive or they've mm -hmm. died from AIDS, mm -hmm. from complications with AIDS. Yeah. And so I I never promised her, mm -hmm. but for me it was an unspoken promise right. that I made that right. I would never have to tell her that. Or and every didn't. birthday that's your gift to her. Yeah. That's perfect. And so I, I didn't feel the need to explain to the kids that were <laughs> No, and I think it's about just like if people can step out of their own stuff and just you know, it's it's a simple solution or simple recommendation is like it's not about you. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should affirm all of us that are negative 
and are posting on this and realize it's mm -hmm. not a bragging or creating no, a hierarchy, not at all. but just a celebration that I've been able to maintain my health and do that. The same way someone who's positive is putting something on their website and saying, you know, I'm undetectable. undetectable. I just got my rights right. back. And I'm, I'm healthy. I got a clean bill of health from my doctor and I'm doing well. My meds are good. Everything. Like we should celebrate all of that because that's all of us. Mm -hmm. Instead of kind of getting all caught up in our own feelings like, mm -hmm. oh, this positive stuff. I don't want to see this stuff on my timeline or right. this negative stuff. You just bragging because this and the other. Those are all kind of hurt right. feelings. And if you can strip away the reactionary stuff that we all have to stuff like that and then mm -hmm. say, okay where's this person coming from right and let me just try to walk in their shoes for a little bit and then and that's easier said than done right. obviously but um, uh, you know because I, I had a book signing at Morehouse and uh, you know there was, there was about a hundred people there that's and then great. at the very end uh, this young guy came up to me and he whispered you know what I, mean? I guess he didn't want to ask in front of everybody else but he, he said to me um, you know I, I just wanted to talk to you because I'm I met this guy and I'm dating this guy and he's HIV positive and I just want to know if you think I should date him. Right. And you know, I would never say one way or the other because again, I think that's a very personal decision. I think it's something that you have to decide right. um, what works for you. And I just think that, you know, as you mentioned before, your, your deal breakers are your deal breakers and you stick to them. So what did you say to him? Right. I told him what I just said to you. I said it's a very personal decision. <laughs> it's up and to you. you. And you have to decide. Only but you it, can answer that for right. yourself. Right. But if your instincts are leading you in one way, then that's the way you need to go. Yeah, and I think you do... You don't do anyone a favor if you're negative and you date somebody Don't positive. date me out of pity. But, yeah, don't date me because you feel sorry for me and then da 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 Like, if that's the case yeah. and someone comes into somebody with somebody who's positive and says, oh, well, you know, I know I don't, I'm not comfortable with this, but I'm going to date him anyway because people are going to think I'm evil if this and that. Uh, exactly. No, because you're actually not doing that person a favor by leading them along. They think that you're okay with it, but secretly it's kind of like tearing and it's you gonna up show inside. In every in, in th it's going to show in everything that you do. Right. In the way that you touch and the way that right. you caress and right. the way that you are intimate right. or not right and you cannot fall in love with the someone way you that react you pity. to bodily fluids all that kind uh, of correct stuff. right but you can't fall and in love with I mean, someone you really pity it's really tough too though to, to stick with that because i've met some really wonderful guys right and this would have this is the only issue right and so in that scenario how do you stay true to to what you feel and what you, you say, just have to you, know? you have to stay true to yourself but then you also i think for a lot of people, they realize like, okay, this is a deal breaker for me, but God, you know, what if that's like, if you believe in like soulmates, what if you believe someone, but that's the only thing in soulmates and, and some, said, yeah. some soulmates in some definitions could be the person that challenges you, not the person that aligns perfectly with everything right. that you want, but the person well, no, that yeah. challenges you and helps you grow in all kinds of ways. And so... You just have to be able to live with that. And again, that's a personal decision because if you look at it well, and say, well... I like so, to introduce them because right. I've met wonderful guys who are positive. You should. Why don't like, you do that? You know, right. Why don't you talk to this person? Right. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, and there are there are dating sites mm -hmm. for people who yes. are positive mm -hmm. to only date positive people. Mm -hmm. But there I think are. that it would be really offensive if there was a date, dating site for because people who were negative. negative. You know what I mean? I just I'm think... I'm trying to think if people... I have a feeling there is. There is? Or I have a feeling... Well, like how do they validate that? I have a that can create liability for a company. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I have a feeling... They're going to get sued. Exactly. Or if people just do that and they just say, well, I'm negative and trying to stay that, stay that way. Or if they see somebody's status as positive at Grind or something like that, then they'll say... No, I'm not going to deal with that. So there's all kinds of stuff going on there. We find way, ways to filter out each the other. The question becomes, how soon should you ask someone if they're positive or not? <laughs> is there a right answer to that? No, there is no right answer, but, you know, the elephant in the room over here, so, since he wanted to shade me earlier, the, ele the elephant in the room over there wants to ask on the first date. And I'm like, ah, oh, that is way too soon. <laughs> I, I think it, it, I mean, it depends on other people, too. It depends on so what you want to do. Yeah, I don't ask. Sometimes I don't wait until the first date. You wait until the f first phone call. Yeah. You want to know, like, immediately. Yes, that's good. Yeah. But from the and I think that is good. But right. I think from now, the perspective I have someone of someone over forty five recently say to me that I was the only person who's ever asked him that, and I was shocked. Um, mm -hmm. And he's positive, right? But you know, and I, he turned I, out to I, be I, negative. But no, he's positive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Right. But um, you know, I want to remove the stigma. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's no, get be, it out in the no, open. No, I should, agree. For me, it should be just like asking your zodiac sign. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's. Uh, it uh, is. I uh, mean, uh, remove the stigma. 
I don't a know. stigma from being an Aries or a <laughs> yeah. Libra. Come on, yeah, get out of here. Right. <laughs> Some people won't date Geminis. Oh my God, get out of here with that. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think it's a very personal decision. And I've I heard people, the only problem I have is when, when people want it one way or the other. And then also realizing, like, again, stepping out of people's comfort zone. So if you're HIV negative, realizing for someone who's positive, like what an emotional roller coaster that may be mm-hmm. for them to actually have to say that in front of you and see what happens and see how difficult that is for mm-hmm. them. Um, and whether it's at the beginning or if it's later on, it, it just depends. Cause I've heard some people say, you know, well, why didn't you wait until you told me early? Like, why did you wait until we were dating for like two months now I get I'm catching feelings for you and you're telling me you're HIV positive but that same person will say if someone says on the first date hey I just wanted to let you know I'm HIV positive why are you telling me so soon we don't even know each other that mm-hmm, well so I was like mm-hmm. okay sweetie get your sh- shit together mm-hmm. either you want to know immediately or you don't don't give mixed messages because this takes the person who's positive but then from, it, and you need to ask about herpes. You need that, you know, not just HIV positive. <laughs> but then from the person, <laughs> that's that's a true thing. That though. Is Actually, true. one of the best experiences I had was somebody who um, said that we were just dating. We were going to mess around. He was like, "I need to let you know something." And I thought it was going to be the conversation about HIV. But mm-hmm. then he said, "You know, I tested positive for uh, herpes before." And this and the other, and I was like, to me, like I, I was actually, I don't know whether it's because I'm a doctor or not, but I was actually so turned on by that. I was like, I just want to molest you right now because. That's hot that you were that yeah. honest with yeah, me yeah. about that. Yeah, like it is because you're a doctor. No, it is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I'm assuming that a lot of people have been exposed to herpes no matter what, yeah. even if Listen, they don't. Listen, it's so. quite admirable for right. someone to say that because I actually was, this was some years ago, um, messing around with this guy. And he said, to, I mean, we weren't having sex, but we were messing around. And he stopped me and said, listen, I have to tell you, I'm HIV positive. Right. Well, you know what I mean? Messing around versus having sex. Well, we hadn't gotten to the point where we were going to... We had just come from dinner. Like, I don't know if it was going to become sex or not. Right, but, right, right. Like, we were just kind of, like, kissing. It was getting a little hot and heavy. And he just said, listen, I need to tell you, you know, I'm HIV positive. That's good. And I have a friend that is positive, and he tells you from the door. Right. Because he wants... Because he says he wasn't given the option to choose. Right. Because the person that he um, contracted it from didn't tell him. Right. He said, I want people to have that option. Right. But from the perspective of the person that's positive, I don't know if everyone is... Well, I know everyone is not going to be open with telling you day one because I don't need 10 and 12, 15 people knowing that I'm positive just because we went to eat at the Sizzler. It's you complex. know what I mean? It's, yeah, you it's know what I mean? That's privileged consider. information. Like, I don't need, like, 15 random people... And some people... Stigma, and, and, and some That some, is the stigma. Some people decide at certain points. So some people would say... You know, because HIV is not going to be transmitted by kissing or right. just like fondling or right. masturbating or something like that. So they'll say, well, we do that stuff. But if we get to like oral sex and definitely if we're going to get down to fucking, then I'm going to tell right. them before that. Because for the same reason, like you, you, when you come right to the door and say it immediately, like, well, we don't even know if we if we even like each other. Right. Like it's like, other, I don't need to along. tell you that. Like, right. I don't even know if I like you or not. Right. And, and the so thing is, I need to know if you're asking my status for your protection or because you want to reject me. You're, uh, or because you're a busybody well, and want to tell somebody else. Well, yeah. because if you're asking just for your protection so that moving forward, you know how to protect yourself and we protect you. That's but that's I mean. different if I'm if you're asking because you just want to know day one just so you can say, oh, okay, I don't want to call him no more. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it could be either or. It could be both. Yeah, that's what you're saying. It could be both. Correct. It could be both. It could be both. (laughs) But I think we're all responsible for our own HIV status. I do too. I agree. Manage it the way you want to. I'm a firm. I'm a firm believer in that because managing your health. You can eat a cupcake because I mean we say sex without condoms feels better. It's better. A piece of cake is damn good, but that don't mean I'm gonna eat. It's better than it's better than kale. Yeah. So exactly. (laughs) It's true. You just have to make these individual decisions. Yeah, I I I never believe in the, the the victim narrative of you know so and so didn't tell me about their HIV status. I was like, most HIV transmission goes on in consensual relationships. They're not exactly. forced. And so if you've got two grown-ass adults doing this, and that's the problem with like some of these HIV criminalization laws mm-hmm. that happen in, you know, ones in the state of Georgia that automatically assume somebody is going to be a victim. I was like, but you didn't ask, 
Mm -hmm. You didn't talk. You were a willing participant in this, and now you want to play the victim. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's equal responsibility. Yes, you could say that person should have told you, but also you're responsible for your body. Absolutely. So if you, if that person either nutted up when you said, tell me about your HIV status, or you didn't know, but you still went through with it anyway, mm -hmm. at that point... I'm sorry. You have right. to take. You have to yeah. be accountable for he that does. at that point because that's does. your body. You you let him penetrate you, and you didn't know their HIV status. And if you ask and so they when tell people you, people say that, then I I think they should fight to change the laws. That's because what we, the law is the law. Because the law right now, that's what they're trying right, to do. Exactly. We are trying because to do right that now in Georgia, you can be convicted if you have sex with someone and you know your HIV positive. And you don't tell even and you don't tell them even if it's just oral sex, right? Which doesn't transmit HIV. Correct. <laughs> Unless so you and you get it's, and you're charged for a felony, so people can be put away for like 20 years for that, mm -hmm. which is crazy because it's almost looked at attempted murder. Like I remember reading an article one time that said you could, you could hit somebody and kill somebody and get less time than then if, if, you, than were if HIV you, positive. you HIV positive had sex without telling somebody, but nothing happened to right. them. You could get more time for that, which is where the laws are like really fucked up. Like yes, it's the law, but, I'm but just we wondering, like, how do you prove that? that? Like if you had sex with someone that was HIV positive. Use protection. You didn't contract anything. How do you then take them to court and prove that you had sex? It's just a litigious society. People want to do that. And so they just... Has anybody to... ever been convicted? Um, you know the story of Michael Williams, the brother who was the wrestler, the college wrestler from St. Louis, with uh, his, his nickname was a Tiger Mandingo. And all the uh -huh. all the little white kids, uh -huh. you know, they had their little black fantasy about the Mandingo, so they wanted him to come, and he had a nice body and probably a big dick, so they wanted him to come over and screw him down. And um, he was positive, and I don't know whether he was on medications or not. I think he was, but the fact that he was actually doing this, and, of course, they wanted it raw, and they wanted it without condoms, and he obliged and just didn't tell them. And so they went around and sued him afterwards. And they These were boys? These were, they were all over 18, so I think they were adults. So, okay. um, and he was convicted, and he's in jail now for 20 years for that. There and was me, a doctor at Grady huh? as well who was convicted. There was a doctor at Grady that was convicted, and his was interesting because it was just oral sex with that that he didn't tell the partner about, too, and he got convicted. Is he still in jail? I don't know if he's still in jail or not. Well, there was one that had multiple partners. I, right. This one wasn't in a relationship, and right, some of right. them were young boys. Right, so yeah. there's that part of it too. But the the fact so of the matter is, under is, eighteen, correct. Under 18. Yeah, but yeah, but this is this is happening, and so the narrative that this puts, and they don't even use science because when they convicted him, the the like medical stuff with it, because I was starting to say, if if somebody's on a a website, and they're saying, you know, I want you to screw me without a condom. Mm -hmm. You're probably not the only person that, that they ask that of, right? And so it's going to be a hard call because I don't. I, I'm trying to remember whether one of Tiger Mandingo's sexual partners may have come out positive, mm -hmm. and he was the one that was suing. But there was no medical to check the genotype to check the strain of the HIV right. if it was the same if it one. Was actually and came you can do that. Them. They didn't do any of that. Right. Whether whether Tiger Mandingo it was on medication, because it could have come from someone else. That did that it could have come from somebody else. And if you're actually online seeking that, then you probably Sought it from other people. As well. Probably, that wasn't his first time. Yeah, yeah, so it wasn't his first time, but you're going to blame it on this dude. And, of course, given the racial climate of Correct. America, you've got a little white boy claiming this big black man, like, abused him and did mm -hmm. him this. The black man's going to lose every time. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it's going to be mm -hmm. in the United States. So... Um, it kind of if he has a public defender, but if he did, yeah, it was access. No, to... he, had, he had a public defender because mm -hmm. he, wasn't, he wasn't... So we're alive. now trying to see uh, decriminalization of... A lot of people are working HIV on that. Cases. A lot of people are working on that. And just to change it, it's not to say that people living with HIV are not responsible or accountable mm -hmm. for disclosing, but it's to say the punishment right. for this, especially in a consensual act, far far outweighs. Right. And what, what we're, we're saying is here. both parties are Absolutely, responsible, whether yeah. you're negative and, or whether you're positive. That's, that's what like I say all the time because I'm like, don't argue one side or the other. Right. If you're HIV negative, don't blame it on the positive part. If the positive partner says, well, it's just their fault. Like, I'm a, I'm a clinician, so I look at it from both eyes, and that's how I'm trying to look at it. It's like, well, you know what? You can't just say the HIV negative person bears all the responsibility. There are two people in this. So as much as you don't want to take all responsibility, you shouldn't put all the responsibility on right. a person who's negative. Both people have to have say... Have culpability. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I probably should have disclosed. It would have been better if I had disclosed. That would have been ideal. And the negative person has to say, you know what? 
I didn't know for sure. So I should have asked. I should have asked. Yeah. Or if I wasn't sure or if I didn't believe them, I shouldn't have gone through with the act Correct. at the beginning. So right. yeah, everyone has to take responsibility. But I remember the very first relationship, and it wasn't even a relationship, but I remember the very first guy that I dated that I absolutely knew was positive. We had never had sex. We had never had any type of sexual contact. Was it while you guys were dating or was it? Yeah, we were before? dating. And he found out that he was positive like two months into it. It's actually how the first book opens. Okay. And it was like this secret that we shared that no one else knew. It was so heavy for me. Um, and, and because I couldn't tell anybody, you know, t- just to kind of help right. me carry right. that burden right. because I was trying to protect him and his anonymity and all of that. It affected me in such a way that I ended up going to a lot of HIV AIDS workshops. So like AIDS Survival Project had like a whole weekend. It was like a Saturday and a Sunday, eight hour day. There were HIV professionals. There were people that were living with the virus. Those of us that were affected. And one of the things that they said was, don't assume anybody's mm-hmm. status here. Assume everybody here is negative. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to get the guy that I was dating at the time to go with me, but he wouldn't go because his thing was, I don't want anybody to... He was worried about his anonymity. Right. And I said to him, I said, well, I'm negative and I'm going. They could think I'm positive. He said, yeah, but the difference is you know that you're negative. not positive. Right. Mm-hmm. And so he wouldn't come, but I would get all this information every single day and I would come home with the, the drug types, the side effects, what we could do sexually, what we shouldn't do sexually. And I was thinking that it was going to help the relationship. But I remember being at that workshop and I remember we had breakout sessions. And I remember being in a breakout session and I was telling my story and how he had found out and all this other stuff. And I remember there was a guy there who specifically said to me, if I was in your position, I would not date somebody positive. He said, and I'm positive. He just said that because of, not from a safety standpoint, But from a psychology standpoint, he said because the he just found out, he said the mental stuff that he's going to go through, the, the back and forth, he said it's just going to be way too much and he needs to deal with that by himself. Right. Subsequently, the relationship did end, but it was because he initiated the break. He, he didn't want to kiss. Um, he oh, was wow. worried about uh, whether or not he was going to live for six more months or six more years like he just didn't he was just in his own head and so it really did interrupt Mm -hmm. the relationship any progress for a relationship and 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 it's interesting you say that because god who i married who was positive um he had only been positive for two years and i felt like someone who's hiv positive really needs to do the work at self-acceptance self-forgiveness reaffirming that stuff uh-huh. before they are healthy enough to enter into a relationship. That's uh, a valid point. Yeah, it's it's. It, I think it's hard. I I see now, like, the patients that I see over at Clayton mm-hmm. uh, County, the trauma they go through. And I have a, a lot of people who have been positive for a long time, like 10, 12 years, and some of them haven't had sex in that long because of that. And so you look at it as almost like, a post-traumatic stress yeah. syndrome mm-hmm. and so something that like lingers and so there's not a period of time after two years like it would be saying if like a family member died mm-hmm. and you're still grieving or mm-hmm. a relationship ended mm-hmm. or a marriage mm-hmm. ended and you're still grieving four or five years later and someone comes up to you and be like motherfucker ain't you over that shit right, yeah and it's right. like wait a minute da, 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 da. so I think we can couch HIV in the same thing and I would couch HIV in the same thing because sometimes I've said to folks like oh my god you haven't had sex in eight years and ten years like is it because did that stop once you tested yeah. positive? And they just look and they're like, yeah. And that was true of him because even after we broke up, we became friends. It took a minute right. for us to be friends because it was it was very difficult for me. Like, right. like this was the first guy that I had fallen for. And we had not had sex. Oh, wow. Um, we hadn't even seen each other naked. You know what I'm saying? But it's, like... it's bad. Ti- it was bad timing. It was very bad timing. And so what happened was... Probably about a year or two, we ended up becoming friends. Right. Like, like we stayed in touch, but it wasn't. He basically weaned himself off of me, or weaned me off of him. <laughs> and I remember when we would talk about dating people, people that we were dating, you know, in the, people we were dating. In the intro. No. After the relationship. Ended. Yes. <laughs> well, I could, your relationship. Yes, I couldn't pull that together for some reason. But we would talk about our respective right. uh, dating experiences, and one of the things, one of the things that I noticed about him, he would never allow himself to get close to someone, and whenever he felt like somebody was getting close to him, He'd he run. would pull away. 
he would stop returning phone calls. Or even if he felt himself getting close to them, he, it would be the same behavior. He would stop returning phone calls. He'd become really inconsistent. Yeah. And what I started to apply to my own life and when I was dating people, right. that I was probably dating people that were doing the same thing. Yes. And I adopted this this language that sometimes it's, it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. And so... And it may have nothing to do with the HIV. Like, there are people right. that will run like a Kenyan marathoner right. when they start to feel sure. like emotional is coming exactly. It has nothing to do with HIV. Right. But with him, with I think him, the timing... Was, with him, it was the HIV and the yeah. timing of, of him becoming... Because like you said, he hadn't started to affirm himself or reaffirm himself right. with his new status because he knew that the day would come that he would have to tell... That of his status, you know, right. about his status. And so right. he just didn't allow anybody to get close to him. Right. And that's hard, too, because when you're describing the context of it, like, if you, this is the first guy you really, really fell mm -hmm. for, like, he's dealing with this other yeah. life-changing thing, which is like, okay, I have this condition now that requires me be on medication, right. and I have to emotionally and medically mm -hmm. and physically deal with all this. And you're like, I'm in love with this dude. Right. Like, what do I need to right. do? And right. it's like, just a bad circle yeah. of events a bad like they created like a perfect storm so that it wasn't going to work yeah but that's unfortunate it, it is unfortunate and and i believe that that was what actually killed him yeah. um what killed him was he would never forgiven himself he's deceased he is deceased what happened david that's in the first book you have the first book are you serious right now <laughs> yes. are you serious you just messed up this really serious moment <laughs> Are you serious right now? I'm serious. I'll Are tell you, you offline because if you're listening, you want to know the you got to go get words book. never spoken. Right. But yeah, he died. And I believe he died because he never really forgave himself okay. for quote unquote making a, a stupid decision. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and I could see that in his face. Like I knew that he, he was never the same person. Right. That's yeah. hard. That's hard. That's really, really hard. You loved him. So one thing that sticks out for me in hearing your story uh -huh. <laughs> is I, I think as a community we don't invest in the not having sex early mm -hmm. part mm -hmm. and just really letting a foundation friendship love whatever mm -hmm. develop yeah uh, and I think part of that is because we're playing catch up for the okay. years that we suppress the feelings right. of being gay right. so we're trying to catch up and oh he, he's he's gonna sleep with me too and we're just too? dudes so. yeah. and, and that absolutely, that. absolutely. Just absolutely. Men. I agree like not to make an excuse like that but like men we tend to and if men dealing with men like of course we're gonna be focused mm -hmm. on sex a lot that's what we do that's yeah, what we right. do we don't <laughs> but even in my 20s I didn't do that you didn't do that no. I, I didn't I either have, but I would have people say to me you need to just have sex. Like, uh -huh. just have sex and have sex. Anyway. Like, I've never been on Grinder. Uh -huh. I didn't know what Grinder was. But, but are you on Jack? You ain't missing I've never up. been on Jack. <laughs> I just want, you know, communication you is not possible. Yeah, I didn't friend. know what either one of them was until someone I, I'm a mentor for mentioned it mm -hmm. to me like two, mm -hmm. three years ago. You ain't missing nothing. Yeah, but You're I really will not. never do any of those things. I did Adam for Adam for a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But other than that, <laughs> I did You were like the same for me. Yeah, yeah. So I want to just kind of give people uh, a little information. So if in the event that you have been exposed to HIV yes, um, or someone that you, you think you may have been exposed to HIV within 24 hours, is that it? 70, with, with 72. 72 hours. But with post-exposure prophylaxis. You can get it from like emergency rooms. I also know that like emergency rooms should have like those. A supply. Like a supply, at least a starter kit to start off. Urgent care centers. Um, I've sent people to Absolute Care, mm -hmm. uh, the practice over there that does a good job with seeing people and even as walk-ins they've done that. Um, just as long as it's within that first 72 hours. 72 Ideally hours. within 36, but if you can get within three days okay. and start it, you take it for a month and then... And so you're asking for PEP and give us the full name again? Post-exposure prophylaxis. Okay. And so it'll be, it's a full HIV regimen. That's the difference from PrEP. For 30 days. For 30 days. PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis is when you're negative, there's no event that triggered it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just one pill with two medications. When you do post-exposure prophylaxis, something happened, you found out someone was positive, or you had a, se a sexual encounter where mm -hmm. the condom broke, or you just didn't use it and mm -hmm. you're concerned, um, it's a three medication regimen. Um, okay. And depending on the states, what they approve and what medications they use, it just depends on. And there's a testing website. Isn't there a website? Is it, was it knowyourstatus.com? Knowyourstatus.com. There's also like some other HIV test locator. There's actually a preplocator.org 
website that finds out if you want to get interested in prep it'll go it'll either geo map on the website where you're at or you can just type in your zip code and you can find providers and clinics that do offer pre-exposure prophylaxis if you're interested in it for insurance so, providers covering prep they do yeah and it can range either from a copay of zero to 20 I've seen to 40 or 50 a month and how much is so it's a 30 day supply is that 30 day supply yeah okay and you do one pill a day one pill a day and take it like a lot of a lot of patients I put on prep they no would, not on the 30 day supply you're saying for prep for yeah. prep oh. yeah so yeah, you prep, a, they usually give it a month at a time with correct like refills and stuff uh, like right that. and so. with the pep it's just the one. Get on and off it. Like with HIV meds, they say you don't stop taking them because. Yeah. So with with prep, the important thing for people to know is that um, when you start prep, they've done research about how long it takes to get into certain parts of the body and tissues, and for it to reach a like acceptable level that it works in the bloodstream, it's going to take about seven days. In rectal tissue, it's also about seven days. For the vagina inside the vaginal tissue, it's about 20 or 21 days. So what we usually tell people is that if you're going to start prep, wait about two to three weeks before if you were planning on being sexually Correct. active. And especially if you kind of said, well, I don't want to use condoms. I don't like using condoms. Wait a little bit before it gets effective. It may take a few days. Kind um, of like a birth control with women. You have to let it get in your system. Yeah, you have to let it get in your system to work. And there have been a lot of analogies with birth control mm -hmm. for this. And you can start and stop it. Like I've had people that have stopped it and said, you know, I, I give a story a lot of times. I had a law student in Philadelphia who said, I'm studying for my bar exam. I'm gonna be living with my parents. There's no way in hell I'm having sex with anybody while I'm living in my parents' house. I'm gonna be there for like a month or two. He was like, can I get off this? And I was like, absolutely you can. Because, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the kind of beauty of it is that risk or what we call risk may be seasonal. It's not mm -hmm. static, it's fluid. Mm -hmm. So people don't sit down, like the analogy with food too, people don't sit down and eat a pint of haagen ice cream every night. Mm -hmm. But if they go through something emotional, or if they just have a bad day and they're like, I deserve this, I'm gonna eat right. it. And so you can do stuff like that. And so when you engage in kind of behavior that may you know, mess up your health status, that isn't something typically that people do you're not eating McDonald's every meal, every well, single day. Well, you day. shouldn't be. Oh, right, exactly, you shouldn't be. But, you know, it's just kind of one of those things. So I think, you know, people need to know that with PrEP, you can get on and off it. Okay. Um, so with HIV drugs, I know in some in some cases, um, you can become resistant. Is that the term that they yeah. use for it? And they might have to switch your medication. Do we have any information about that with PrEP? With PrEP, we do, yeah. So the information about PrEP is that what we train providers to do is make sure they do the HIV testing before they start like you have to confirm that someone's hiv negative before you start them on prep right if you're suspicious by symptoms like if they have like that flu type syndrome uh -huh. that some people will get um they tell you to wait a month maybe six weeks and retest them again to confirm they're negative because when resistance comes into play think about it this way for resistance to happen to a medication you have to have virus in the bloodstream mm -hmm. if you're negative if there's no virus in your bloodstream there's no way that it just logically it's not going to make sense because you can't get resistant there's no virus to get mm -hmm. resistant to the medication so I, the main thing is that if people are in the act of what we call seroconverting uh -huh. like you just going from negative to negative positive you just got exposed and maybe the antibody test is negative and the virus is like at a really high level because it's just established itself it's uh -huh. at a high level that's when you don't want to start somebody on prep because if you dip and just put those two medications in that one pill once a day, it's not enough to combat to, the virus, right. and the virus is gonna get tricky and get resistance. But the cases of resistance are extremely rare, like extremely, extremely rare. I guess because I'm wondering, like if a person is on PrEP for a while, is there a chance that they could ex get exposed to HIV and then zero convert because they're now if, resistant? If no, because, no, no, it's not because they're resistant. It's if they come across somebody who's had HIV and has a strain that's, that's resistant to, that to one or a couple of the the medications in Truvada. So that's more reason why you don't need to be out here having raw sex just because you're on prep. But again, people choose to do what what they do yeah and you just have to educate them to say hey you could get other stis you could come across somebody because the, the person that i know who tested positive he kind of has a reaction when folks start talking about prep because he was on it and then it was like it failed but the guy was like resistant to everything had been long term in and out of care like not really taking care of himself and so again that's why it, it speaks to what you guys are saying like starting the conversations early mm -hmm. like having this conversation so 
I, I don't think there's a wrong or right way to do it. Like your way, if you said like, let's have this conversation. So I need to know, like I'm negative. Are you negative? Like what's going on? Like there's nothing wrong with that because it opens up the door with that. Just because someone else may not agree or someone else may not be like, well, that's not how I would do it. There's no right way to do it. There's only the right way for you. So if that works for you, that's the way you do it. If it doesn't work for you, go on and say, let me get to know you first with a few dates before I start asking you about your HIV status. Because we're not having sex for these first few dates. We anyway, just go to the movies. Right, we right. just doing this. We may kiss or do something or just hug and stuff. But I'm not trying to do that. So once I get ready that I think, hey, this dude may be around for a while and you know, I'm gonna, I may start fooling around with him, then you ask the question. But different people, let people have different things and handle it the different ways they do if it works for them. If we can step out of our own shoes and try to understand where someone's coming from. Mm -hmm. It's really important, and particularly with us, there's a lot of hurt in like the black gay community. Mm -hmm. And so if we can just step out of our shoes and hear where someone's coming from, it may not justify how people act or what they do or how you know I act or you act or you act, but it will provide some context. And then you can make the grown ass adult man decision that, mm -hmm. you know what, I can't deal with that. But I just think if we try to be more understanding and with this HIV negative positive thing, be more understanding of what someone who's positive is going through and the day to day shit they have to go through. And then someone who's negative, kind of the worry they have and what the pressure like both aspects have to be validated. Mm -hmm. um, and so to dismiss any of those options or experiences or perceptions, I think is wrong. Yeah, I, I just, again, I just really wanted to have an honest conversation about this, uh, free from fear, right. judgment, because I think that there are people who have real concerns. Um, and as present as HIV is in the gay community, it's not a conversation that we often have, other than the surface conversation of, oh, mm -hmm. well, have you been tested or have you been tested? We don't really have those conversations as it relates to the psychology behind dating someone as positive. Or disclosing your HIV status to a person. You know what I mean? Like, we, we don't really have those I think it would be good to have, like, a forum. And I may yeah. mention that to um, Charles Stevens, who does some yeah. work, work with the counter narrative, and Johnny Cornegay, because they, they get us together a lot. They have a lot mm -hmm. of forums. And I think that would be an interesting one to have, to mm -hmm. have, like, kind of an open conversation so people could just sit down and listen. And without judgment. Look, without because judgment. It, because, just again, listen. I, I really applaud you for coming on and saying. I am not open to dating someone HIV positive because I think that's a choice that right. he should be able to sure. make. We all should be able to make sure. if that's the choice that you make without being punished Absolutely. or persecuted right. Right. for making that choice. Right. Um, as long as you're being honest with yourself and what you what, mm -hmm. what are deal breakers, what you can mm -hmm. deal with, what you cannot deal with. I may mm -hmm. not be able to deal with the fact that someone, I definitely can't deal with smoking. Or, yeah, like smoking or someone <laughs> leaves the toilet seat up or someone, you know, does this or does that. Like that may be a deal breaker for me. So we all have them. I think we just need to be honest and respectful of right. that and then just kind of move forward. And as I and as I began, it's important to have these difficult conversations um, where sometimes it, it may come off offensive. Um, we may step on a couple toes here and there, but and that's no, the only way not, that you learn. Yeah, not everyone's going to agree. Like, people and will find things in the, within this blog of what we talked about. And say, well, well why you didn't did talk about that? this, and why yeah. did you say that? You're never going to please everybody right. all the time. You can just start right. the conversation. Right. And, I and think so, that's, as, that's yes. what you've done. so, as long as we've sent some sort of vibration into the community and, and it's peaking thoughts and interests, <laughs> and, you know, it, it may shift the way that you think one way or the other. Right. And again, and this they can continue the conversation. Absolutely. Yes. And, and apply it to your own life. Yeah. And this is not just a conversation for gay men, in particular, black gay men. So share this with the women in your life. Absolutely. I know there are a lot of women listening. Absolutely. So this applies to you as well. So this is a universal conversation. Absolutely. So thank you for coming. Did you want to share your uh, social media? Not you, but did you want to share your <laughs> social media? <laughs> Dr. David. The Twitter, it's at D Malbranch. M A L E B R A N C H E. Um, I'm on Facebook and I'm also on uh, Instagram. I think it's D M A L E B R. So and go on over there to Morehouse School of Medicine. Just ask for him. Just go yell in the hallway. And as always, I am Craig the Writer Stewart. My Instagram is Craig the Writer Stewart. My Facebook is also Craig the Writer Stewart. And more information about me is on my website, which is CraigTheWriterStewart.com. Thank you for listening. As always, be safe and keep loving yourself. <laughs>